Thank you and welcome to this late session. I know that it is, it's hard to be here the whole day and the second day. So um, this presentation is about test containers. Uh, before I discovered it, I was doing the usual tests and uh, trying to mock things in order to speed up tests and not uh, add the complexity of those layers to our application. But when I discovered test containers, it was like a game changer. So I would like to share with you what was my, basically my experience. Um, I'm Jonathan, um, I'm Java champion and uh, one of the Barcelona Java user uh, uh, group uh, organizers. And also, as um, Martin said, uh, one of the founders of uh, JVCN, Conf or DevBCN, is a conference that we host in Barcelona. Last year we had like uh, more than 1,000 attendees. So if you don't have any better plans in June, maybe Barcelona, it's a good option. Um, I've been a developer for more than 30 years, uh, but I always say that uh, the language that I liked the most, apart from Java, was Delphi. Anybody used Delphi in the past? Okay, great. Um, but I also work as a developer advocate for Sonar. If you want to know more, just simply scan this QR code. Oh, I always forget about this effect. Um, and what is Sonar? Well, basically, Sonar is a company that is behind SonarLint or SonarCube. Anybody doesn't know anything about SonarCube? So, uh, you? Perfect. I will explain it. Uh, so, for the rest, you already know it. Um, SonarCube is a tool that will help you analyze your project and will show some issues uh, and bugs and CVs and uh, security uh, issues that you can have. And they have like a SonarLint that it is a free plugin uh, for most of the IDEs. So if you don't use it, well, maybe let's give it a try because it's free for commercial usages and it covers more than 30 languages at the same time. So if you have JavaScript, Java, and Kubernetes deployment artifacts, uh, it's going to scan them all at the same time. But also we have SonarCube that it is uh, also free in the community edition that you can run yourself, do a Docker run if you want, or Sonar Cloud that it is the hosted version. Uh, that it is also free for open source uh, projects. So if you are behind uh, any foundation, definitely give it a try because it's free. Uh, it's connected to several DevOps uh, platforms like uh, GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, and so on. You want to know more, just ping me afterwards or just go to the sonarsource.com. I would love to offer swag from Sonar that I brought yesterday, but it vanished yesterday. So <laughs> sorry for that. Um, OK, so what can you expect from this presentation? Well, basically, I will give you a brief introduction of what's test containers, um, the basic usage, but also a real example of a project that we had uh, back in the days at Red Hat uh, uh, that, for me, it was very interesting. But in any case, it's only my experience, and I'm here not to teach you anything, just show you my experience. Um, if you are following the series, uh, The Mandalorian, this is not the way. This is only one way. Uh, OK, uh, also the slides, the QR for the slides, if you want to follow them as I'm talking about them. So let me introduce you which was the project that we were using. So basically, we had an Apache Camel integration platform. Uh, who knows Apache Camel or have used Apache Camel? Definitely, it's an amazing project that allows you to integrate different layers. Awesome. I love it. So we have this project that was receiving information from the user with this happy face, um, sending files. We were doing some kind of magic in the project, sending it to a third-party project, also coming from uh, Red Hat, but not from our team. This project was doing another magic. It was storing some things in an S3 bucket and sending a topic in Kafka saying, hey, I did something with that file. We were again receiving that file connected to the Kafka topic, sending it to a JBPM in order to follow and execute some rules with that payload, receiving the calculation, storing the file in S3, and all of this, considering security that was stored in a 
PostgreSQL database and storing information in a PostgreSQL database. Well, it's a lot of asynchronous movements and considering a basic payload, a lot of things. Uh, so, yeah, we could start just mocking everything and then testing isolated our code. Yes, we were doing unit tests, of course. I'm not here to talk about unit tests. But in terms of integration tests, well, there are a lot of layers here that we should mock. Uh, and when you are mocking, it's like you are, sometimes it's like you are cheating to the solitaire. You already, if you are cheating with uh, the rules, uh, it's not the real case. So we wanted to test everything. So we wanted to test basically that our connections to S3 were working regarding, well, um, ephemeral links that we were using with, S with S3 and so on. Also with Kafka, because we wanted to be sure that the index that we were using was fine. And also with the PostgreSQL database that we were storing the information as it was needed. So the client's connections, we wanted to test them uh, as a real test. But also the version. So it's not the same as using PostgreSQL 9.6 or 8 or Kia, that it is the baby PM, baby BPM engine uh, in version 7.3 or 6.5. So we wanted to test our application with real versions. With Apache Camel, you create routes. You say, from this endpoint, I will consume something, I will have a processor, and I will send it somewhere. This endpoints definition are basically strings. So you define a string, defining which is the connector, and then you define the parameters for that connector. This is a string. And the same for the endpoint, for the result. So we wanted to be sure that we were not messing with all those strings. If you are mocking the connection with, uh, uh, with uh, Camel, then in reality, maybe you are introducing something that it is wrong in the endpoint. So we wanted to check that the connections with uh, Apache Camel were correct, connecting to Kafka and S3. But also we wanted to test everything, considering that we had three different uh, services, asynchronous, running on the uh, running on the background. So it's not the same as testing something that it is synchronous. OK, you have an endpoint, you have a payload, you process it, and then you test it. Then having the payload and the result has to be the processor, the different processors in uh, an asynchronous project process. So we wanted to test also asynchronousity in our project. And in the end, we wanted to also test our project with a specific configuration for the Kia server and the Apache Camel. So it's like you, got, you can have a test configuration. Everything runs fine. But then you go to production, and they introduce a the different configuration in the Kia server. Oops. And then something breaks, because you don't have exactly the same as you have in production. So we want it to be as close as it could be to the production environment without having to create an environment that it is not ephemeral. The, the key point is to be ephemeral. But also, the important point here is, OK, but we want to have this running every time that someone wants to merge anything to the main branch. So it's not that we are going to do a test now and then. No, no, no. We want to have this test to be executed every time. We even had tests to check performance. OK, I know. The real environment of this test is not exactly the same as the production in terms of CPUs, memory, and so on. But we wanted to have like kind of a performance test knowing that in that given environment, everything was working. So in the real environment, it would be most likely to work. So 
In our case, we had GitHub with uh, checks, and the execution was running on Travis, <coughs> and Travis executed all the tests with test containers. Yes, it took a lot. So it was taking 30, 40 minutes to run all the tests because it is really spinning up machines and doing performance tests. That's fine. But we were not so uh, concerned about the time on this running test because it's, it's not on our machines. It's running on the background. So um, considering all of this architecture and what we wanted to test, we decided to use test containers. Have anybody used test containers before? OK, for those of you, maybe you know more than me about test containers. But for the rest, maybe this is uh, interesting. Um, so well, test containers is an open source project you can use uh, before, well, like some months ago, it was backed by Atomic Jar. Now is, Atomic Jar is part of Docker. Um, but it's still open source, so you can use it. So basically, what is test containers? You have your app, and you have your JUnit tests. And what it's going to do is it's going to connect your JUnit test lifecycle with a test container module that it will be connected on that, on that lifecycle. Behind that, it will use the library Docker for Java. And below that, there are containers, Docker containers, basically. So the life of those containers, usually, most of the cases, uh, will be connected to the life cycle of your JUnit test. When your test dies, the container dies. Test containers have libraries for several languages, from Python to Go, Elixir, or Rust, behind, among others. But also Java. Java would be one of the main modules. So basically, the two main modules now are Java and Go. These are maintained by Atomic Jar slash Docker employees, too. Um, and as you can see, there are lots of people already contributing to those modules. But they also have other modules, mainly contributed by communities. OK, so those modules usually have way less people contributing to them. And the original maintainers are not basically doing them. It's the community who are doing them. But you can see that there are lots of languages. So maybe your language or the one that you're using, mostly it's here. And one of the good things about test containers is not that it only provides like the technology to connect Docker containers to your JUnit uh, test. It's that they already provide a lot of modules that are already optimized. So you can have like Cassandra or ClickHouse or MongoDB. Uh, modules that they have already created them using an optimized way of doing uh, them. And it's way easy to use them for you. You just simply instantiate the module, set some parameters, that's it. They also have, apart from databases, other modules where you can have, I don't know, an Nginx server or Kafka, making everything very easy to use. Another concept that is important for you to understand test containers is when you are running your JUnit and you spin up three containers, those containers are going to use like a user port. So if you have Postgres, you have 5432. This is the usual port. But what if you have two databases running on those ports? you are going to have problems of port usage. <clears throat> so basically, what Test Containers does is to use random ports. So you say, yes, I'm going to run PostgreSQL database. And they say, yes, fine. It's 5432. 
but we are going to give another port. So it's a random port that is not going to clash with any other port in use. That's why they use containers, uh, sorry, random ports. So you have your different ports used in your container. Maybe you are only exposing one. They are going to create an ephemeral port. And finally, this is the one that your application needs to connect to. The life cycle of the test containers, according to your tests, is basically when you start a test, containers start. This takes, takes time. Then you do the test. And finally, for each test method, the container stops and gets deleted. Or you can have a per test suite where you start up your containers at the beginning and then you close them at the end. This has a problem not from the test containers point of view, but from the test point of view. Because you are reusing a container and the impact of one test can modify the result of another test. So it should be that every test uh, is not affected but by anyone. But you can choose which way do you want to start your containers. But there are always ways to hack that. So if you have a system that it is using Postgre database very heavily, you can say, OK, but if for every test I need to spin up one and close, a, uh, close it, then spin up again another one, inject the information, the base information, and close it again. It's going to take a, lot, a long time. Then you can reuse those containers. For that, it is going to automatically is going to check which is the container that it needs to reuse. So you are going to start the container, and you are going to reuse it until you close it manually. This is another way. This is not the usual way, but you can do it. So the tasks that you can do with test containers basically are, well, you're going to define which is the test container that you want. I want to a Postgre database, an S3, I don't know, Kafka. You define which is the test, the container that you want. And for that, you have different ways of doing it. I told you that they provide out-of-the-box modules. So Kafka container is already provided by them. But you can also create containers based on Docker image. If you have a Docker image, it will pull it from Docker Hub. Or if you have a Docker file, it will build the image. It will spin up the container. Once you have your uh, container defined, then you are going to start it. You're going to... Um, Connect it to the test lifecycle, either automatically using JUnit rules, for instance, or manually. Manually, synchronously, or manually in parallel. We will see that in a moment. But then when you have your test, you have your Docker containers, somehow you need to connect this. And if you remember, we have random ports. So you don't know beforehand which is the port that your Postgre database is going to run. So you need something to get which is the port and then connect your test to that port that is going to use that container. And finally, you will finish the containers either manually or automatically connected to the test. So let's see how was the usage of test containers in the project that I showed you before. So basically, we had real containers in green. That means we had the real container for this ingress project, for Kie, RBAC security, and Postgre database, and for Kafka. But for obvious reasons, we didn't have a real container for S3. We cannot have S3 as a container. 
So what we had is like, a, I wouldn't say a fake, but I would say a similar uh, element that it is in this case, it's Minio or local stack. Local stack is in a very interesting project that simulates uh, Amazon. So you have different services that you can run locally in a container. And for your application, it will look like if it's connected to Amazon. So we had real and kind of semi-real containers for our application. And the way we defined our containers, it's very easy. As I said, for those out-of-the-box modules, it's just simply instantiating a new class called PostgreSQL container, Kafka container, Cassandra container. We specify the attributes to start the container, and that's it. With this one line divided in four, uh, we had a PostgreSQL database running that for a, our application, it was like if it was connected to a production one. Also with a Docker file. In this case, for that ingress project that we had from Red Hat, what we had was the Docker file image. Well, the Docker file. So for that, we were saying, OK, test containers. Create a container using this Docker file. So at that time of the creation, it took the Docker file that we had in the file system, build the container, and run it. And for the other tools, what we used was generic container, and then we specified the image to be pulled from Docker Hub. Easy. These are the three ways of defining containers. So for the real ones, we had image from Docker file for the ingress. And for Kie, we had a generic container uh, having the Kie server image. For RBAC, we had, again, an image, uh, con a generic container with an image. But for Postgre, we had out of the box container. And for Kafka and local stack container, we had also an out of the box container. For the Minio, what we had is pulling an image from Docker Hub. So these are the different ways of defining the containers that we were using. Once we have all the containers defined in our test, OK, these are the machines that I'm going to use. OK, now we need to start them. Easy, if we do it manually, dot start, it starts, fine. But we can do it also in parallel. So we can have a list, a stream, of all the containers that we want to, stand to start at the same time. And test containers will try to start them all at the same time. But in some cases, you have dependencies. In our case, Minio is a system that emulates having buckets like S3. But it has two Docker containers, one that creates the system and another one that is going to create the bucket. It's obvious that we cannot run the bucket creation before we have the system already running. That's why we say, OK, this Minio MC container depends on another container. So it cannot start one before the other has started. So with this and the parallel execution, we can define several containers running in parallel or starting in parallel. But for some of them, we have a sequence. Or we can use JUnit 4, uh, for instance, or uh, Spring Boot uh, container. Uh, in order to define uh, annotations, in order to define which are the containers that we are going to use in that test, and they are going to be started and uh, stopped according to the test. So this is the automatic way of starting these containers. But also another important thing that we are going to do with our containers is logging, because sometimes 
shit happens. So we need to check if something happened. Um, and we are going to have a big log with all of our containers. So what we need is a prefix that is going to say, hey, this lock comes from this machine. And we do that with just simply adding with lock consumer. Then we specify that it is an SLF4J with a name, a prefix. And then all the lock from every machine will be uh, appended to that lock, common lock, but with a prefix for every machine. Also, we can get the locks uh, manually for each container with the get locks method. Remember that we said we have random ports. So we need something to connect to those machines. In some cases, we are going to also have connections between those containers, not only from the J, uh, J unit test. For those cases that we want to connect between them, maybe what we want to use is naming. In this case, we can create networks, and then we define which is the network that several containers are going to use at the same time. So from that network, they can see each other using naming. But then we need to get the information from the container. So it's like, OK, you are a Postgres container. Tell me which is your port, because I don't know. But I need to have it before trying to connect to you. So we are going to see now in a minute how we got all the ports from the different containers in order to connect our tests to them. Also, in terms of starting uh, containers, it's, a, it's not an easy concept. You can have a machine that has started because it has started to run services. But in terms of the consumers, when you say this machine has started, means it's ready to uh, respond to requests. So for this, also, test containers have two different strategies. Startup strategy is, OK, when it runs, it runs, that's it. Or we can define which is the wait strategy in order to say, OK, just uh, wait for a message in the log or wait for that an, uh, API request returns a certain value or for our method that it is checking for the health check. When that is true, then the container is ready. You remember that depending the, the dependencies. So if we use the wait, then the second container will not start until the wait uh, strategy also has started. Usually, the default one is the startup, but you can use also the wait strategy. In our case, we had in the first iteration, we had Spring Boot. On the second iteration, we had Quarkus. But in the first one, um, we needed to pass the attributes for connecting to those containers to Spring Boot, because you have a file with all of your attributes. But this is not working for test containers, because it's a dynamic value. So for that, we were using context configuration and using say, uh, the initialize method that we were passing the uh, env env environment attributes for every test. With this, Spring Boot was just simply uh, overriding the values coming from the properties with these values that were dynamically calculated. But if you use a more modern approach of a Spring Boot, you can use dynamic property source. And then in that case, you can calculate uh, the, the port because in the first part, we define the Postgres SQL container that it is a container, so it's connected to the life cycle of the test. But then we are asking that container to give us the first mapped port. With that, we will have the port to connect our test. 
we are going to add this value to the context, to the spring context, and then our test will uh, run perfectly well because even Spring Boot will not know exactly that it is connecting to a dynamic value. <coughs> or if you are using a Spring Boot 3, you can just simply have service connections and then it will take care of all of those connections. It's an easier way. So every time that you are trying to connect to a container that is Postgre database, then it will uh, have the ports uh, dynamically and easily. And finishing the containers, well, basically, you can stop them manually. But I would say that the best way that to do it is automatically connecting your test to the life cycle of your, uh, of your test. Everybody is with me at this moment. Any questions so far about test containers? It's a brief introduction. Just I want you to make curious about test containers and go out there and check it and try it. Uh, in the end of the presentation, you have the links to the, to the repositories where you can just check how we did this. As AI is a common topic nowadays, well, test containers also has some containers for AI. So they already created several vector databases containers that you can use in your applications very easily. It's very easy to, in this case, use a local model for, uh, for AI using Olama. And you have to use the Olama container out of the box. That's it. And in this case, we are saying, OK, this is a substitute for Olama. Why? I will show you in a moment. Because what we do is we have this Olama container. We are going to pull a model, because Olama can run lots of models. So we are going to run to pull a model. We are going to commit to that image, because the Olama image is small. But the model is super big. Instead of downloading super big images, what we do is we download the Olama image, very small. Then we download the image for the well, we download the model that we want. There are hundreds. And then we are going to combine them, commit to the image. And then we are going to say, OK, now we are going to have this new container that it is a compatible substitute for Olama. So every time that I use Olama, what I'm going to use is this container that has the Olama plus the model. And finally, you just simply use the, in this case, Olama chat model builder, and you just generate with, uh, you, can, you connect to the Olama container, Olama get host and first map port, and then the chat will use Olama and will respond. So you have a local uh, LLM connected through a container run by test containers. Very easy. Also, I want to show you how it would be done with Quarkus. Who is using Quarkus in production? Amazing. <laughs> Great. For the rest, just give it a try. It's nice. I love it. And um, the one thing that Quarkus has is well, is well on the ahead of time compilation technologies. But the good thing is that Quarkus is based on open source uh, projects. So it's, um, it's very interesting. You don't need to learn new things. Just simply use Quarkus behind. That's, that's very interesting. And Quarkus, well, gives it's a, a framework that it is very, very uh, connected to be uh, Kubernetes native because it's going to produce native images that are fast to start and consume uh, less memory. It can work with Graal VM in order to produce native native artifacts, and it's based on open source libraries. Uh, 
no, they don't create new ones. They just simply reuse open source libraries. It's a very uh, live project with a lot of contributors, and a lot of companies are also providing uh, libraries that can run with Quarkus too. And finally, just to introduce Quarkus, comparing an application running in Spring, for instance, it takes around four seconds to start. Just going to, to Quarkus, it takes one second and a half. But going to native, that only involves adding dash p native in the command line without touching anything, we move from around four seconds to uh, more than uh, 200 milliseconds. So definitely is something very important to try, even if you are going to lambdas uh, or just to increase the density of your cluster. If we use test containers with Quarkus, there is one way of creating our resources. And what we need to do is to create, well, a Quarkus test, test resource. And we are going to define, OK, which are the properties. And then what we are going to do is to use them. We are going to implement the methods in order to start the container in order to uh, define it, in this case, we are defining which is the container that we, that we need, PostgreSQL container. And then we inject the properties to the context, and then we stop them. And this is connected to the, the test lifecycle, as you can see up there, Quarkus Test Resource Lifecycle Manager. So this is a way of using test containers with Quarkus, or even easier, if you have your application and then you want to connect to a PostgreSQL database, you just only need to add the TC in the URL to connect to that uh, uh, database. And then it will, Quarkus will, use the connect, the, uh, the, will get the port and will get uh, to connect to that database. Or even better, similar to what Spring Boot does, you don't define anything in the test profile but your, uh, Quarkus detects that your application is connecting to a PostgreSQL database, but nothing has been configured to connect to database, to that database. So Quarkus will try to connect, get the ports, and connect the applications. I'm just finishing the presentation with some uh, links that you can check uh, when you get the, the slides. And basically, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. And Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to rate me and give me bad reviews if you didn't like. It always helps too. Um, if you have questions, I'm I'm here. Thank you very much.